Natasha Becker is the inaugural curator of the African art of African art at the Fine Arts Museums in San Francisco. She joined the museums in December 2020 and currently oversees the historical and contemporary collection of African art. Working in both South Africa and North America over the past decade, she has focused on presenting the work of women and artists of African descent, organizing numerous exhibitions and international initiatives. Ms. Becker served as the Assistant Director for Mellon Initiatives at the Clark Institute for seven years, and more recently as an independent curator with the new art gallery at the Ford Foundation Center for Social Justice. She also has served as a curatorial advisor at the FACE Foundation, curator in residence at Faction Art Projects in Harlem, and senior curator at the Goodman Gallery in South Africa. Natasha is a founding co-director of Assembly Room, which is a curatorial platform for the advancement of women curators and artists in New York. She holds a master's in African history from the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa, and studied history at Binghamton University in New York. Please join me in welcoming Natasha Becker. Go ahead, Natasha, you're on. Oh, but we cannot hear. Hmm. Okay, it seems we're having a little technical difficulty here. Can you all hear? Okay. Uh, Natasha, can you hear me? Your, your audio is off. Can you hear me? Hi, good evening, Shadow. There yes. we go. Welcome. I can hear you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm coming to you from San Francisco at the De Young Museum, and I respectfully acknowledge that I'm a Tush Ohlone, the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula, as well as the Miwok, Yokuts, Patwin, and other Ohlone people who live in the Greater Bay Area. It's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists and um, discussants for this evening, Nairi Blankenberg and Mayowa Tamori. Nairi Blankenberg is the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, the nation's mu uh, premier museum devoted to the arts of Africa. Previously, she was a consultant for museums and cultural destinations around the world finding innovative ways to connect cultural resources to new audiences and reimagining the museums of the future. She has advised clients on concept development, operations and business planning, programming, stakeholder and public engagement, and much more. Her recent consulting clients before joining the Smithsonian Museums include the National Gallery of Canada, Superblue Museum and Archive of the Constitution, at the Hill uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, uh, MEG Geneve, Geneve uh, Musée Ethnographie, Olympic de Marseille Football Club, and other global and local institutions. In 2017, Nadi Blankenberg served as the head of content and strategy for Cosmandion, an Amsterdam based design agency where she helped museum clients shape their interpretive approaches to exhibitions, uh, their strategic planning, and the uh, new business development and content development. Um, Niger has also spent many years at Lord Cultural Resources as a principal consultant between 2008 and 2016. Um, following that, she served as the director of Lord Cultural Resources Group in Europe. In addition to her extensive work consulting for institutions and cultural heritage sites, she is an award-winning TV and documentary producer and director, public speaker, and a published author. Nari holds a Master of Arts in Media and Cultural Studies from the University of Natal in Durban, South Africa, and a bachelor's degree in journalism from Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Our other guest is Mayowa Tamori. 
who is a creative technologist, a storyteller, and a visual artist. In 2021, Mayoa released Casting Memories, an open source digital gallery, recreating some of the looted Benin bronzes using 3D modeling software. As stated on the website for the project, I quote, we wanted to liberate these objects by making it possible for people to print them at home or even view them in their own spaces using augmented reality. Casting memories is about confronting the impact and the legacy of looted African art and white supremacy in museums. Through the perspective and intimate experiences of a Nigerian artist, technologist, scammer, learning about the art stolen history and identity through, ben through the Benin bronzes in the Smithsonian collections to illustrate how creativity can be used to transform, reclaim and remix painful memories into liberative new media. The project also represents a series of op open source downloadable 3D art projects inspired by the Smithsonian's collections. Welcome to you both and thank you for joining us. Let's jump right in. Um, you have both been actively participating in the arena of restitution and restoration uh, of Royal Benin artworks from uh, the Kingdom of Benin in modern day Nigeria. You have come at this from completely different directions, um, experiences, and uh, and and interests, all of which overlap also in some way. Could you just uh, tell us about um, your involvement within um, the restitution of Benin bronze artworks? And I will say the restitution and restoration, as I said before, because um, your projects straddle, you know, both um, both areas. Uh, the title of this program is Restorative Futures. And so this question is really about um, your experience, both your different experiences. And uh, if you could um, both contextualize that for us, but also reflect uh, perhaps a little bit on, you know, um, what those experiences entailed and what you um, learned from that and where you are at right now. Thank you. Who would like to go Nair, first? I was gonna say Nairi, do you wanna jump in? <laughs> I was gonna say you. <laughs> um, so I'll go, fine, fine. I'll take the first stab at it. Um, it's really nice to be here. Hi, Natasha, and with Mayowa. Um, I wanted to first apologize for that somewhat obnoxious bio. As you were reading it out, I was like, that was my from my hustling for work days of <laughs> bios. Now that I got the job, I don't have to hustle so badly in the bio. Um, but yes, yeah, so I joined uh, the Smithsonian National Museum for African Art um, in July 2021 during COVID times. Um, I was living at the time in Spain um, and then was able to get into the US in October. Um, so have been here for just um, over a year. Um, and one of the first things I did when I arrived at the museum is that we had a number of bronzes um, that was in the collection of the museum that I took down from view. So they were up in our exhibition um, called Visionaries. They were contextualized as being looted from the 1897 raid, um, but they were on view. Um, and as a, as a South African um, myself, um, it, I found it um, disturbing. I, I was quite, um, I, we were talking earlier and, and I'll, I'll let Maya talk about that, but I, I have, I've spent my life sort of having quite uh, visceral negative reactions in museums um, around stuff that shouldn't be there. And so I felt very uncomfortable and really didn't want it to be in a museum that I was, um, I guess, overseeing. So we took them off of you. <laughs> um, and, and started the process, I called up uh, Professor Abatijani of the National Commissions of Museums and Monuments and said, you know, we have these, what would you like us to do with them? And that, that's when we all started the process of uh, restitution. And so we finally did uh, transfer ownership of 29 of the bronzes in our collection um, to the government of Nigeria on the 11th of October. 
Um, so just over a month ago, a month and a half ago, um, and um, physically took them back to Nigeria. We have a number, um, we have six um, that continue to be researched that are still in our collection. Um, and we have an additional nine that we've kept on loan um, through an agreement with the National Commission of Museums and Mon Monuments. Um, and so my coming coincided with the Smithsonian establishing an ethical returns working group, which was already looking at um, what do we do you know, around ethical returns and shared stewardship in our collection. And that was initiated through Undersecretary Kevin Gover, himself a former director of the National Museum of the American Indian, um, and, and Undersecretary Ellen Stofan, um, obviously with the support of the new secretary, um, Lonnie Bunch. And so the institution writ large had already started looking at this. I think it's important to know that the Smithsonian has had a long history of repatriation through the National Museum of the American Indian and both NMAI and the National Museum of Natural History both have repatriation offices. Uh, um, offices. But I think the bronzes really and the ethical returns policy and the return of the bronzes is the first action on that policy really talked a lot more about um, how the museums really were the expectation on the museums was to be a lot more proactive in reviewing what was in our collection um, and addressing it in one way or another. Uh, and so here we are. Thanks for that, Nairi. <clears throat> Sorry, Natasha, I cut you off. No, no, not at all. I was saying the same thing, so. Yeah, um, again, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm so excited that restitution and repatriation is, you know, becoming a larger part of public dialogue. Um, I have never worked for a museum. Um, I came to this work because of a really, really complicated encounter in my mid twenties, where I was, uh, I think I, I was, I'm from Nigeria. I was born in Nigeria. Um, I left when I was eight years old and, um, have lived outside of Nigeria for most of my life. And when I was in my mid twenties, I walked into, uh, a museum in Indianapolis, Indiana of all places. And I saw all of these Benin bronzes that were attributed to unknown artists from Nigeria. And I had never seen those objects before. Um, and there was something really strange about like being in a museum, learning about your objects from people who are complicit in the theft of those objects from your culture. And then also like there's something that's really complicated about not even recognizing or knowing anything about these objects. Because the truth is, so thorough was the erasure of colonialism and of these objects that even if I lived in Nigeria, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't know about these objects. I wouldn't learn about them. And I think because the way I move through the world is like, you know, I'm, I'm a creative person. I sort of try to create the type of world that I want to live in. And I didn't want to live in a world where I was a victim, where I was reliving essentially this point of cultural humiliation from over 100 years ago that is essentially what happens when you walk into a museum as a Nigerian or anyone who's seeing looted art. I really wanted to make it about my own personal experience and sort of like transform my relationship to these objects. And so I started a, a project or a company essentially called uh, Loot, Loot Merch or Loot Co. And kind of our entire sort of reason for existing is because we wanted to like essentially steal back the art that was stolen from us. And so using 3D scanning and different types of technology, um, we were able to um, just like essentially scan and recreate these objects, give them away, and then essentially create a way for people to experience and see them on their own terms. And that was just really important for me to recontextualize my relationship to these objects. You know, I wanted to be able to take them out of the museum quite literally. Like these are the same objects on a beach in Nigeria at a gallery. Um, so it was very important for me to create a way for me and other artists, writers, to create personal experiences with this art. So what that has looked like in terms of the work I've been doing from a restitution perspective 
it's been all about taking these objects that are difficult to access if you don't live in the West and making it really easy to distribute by texting, by going to our website, by going to our Sketchfab and downloading these models so you can use them um, without permission, um, without having to step into a museum. So that's how I ended up in this work. Kind of digital restitution. Yes, exactly. Right. And I think maybe a, an important thing is that these are not our objects. We open source and give them away freely. And we let people decide how to, um, yeah, how to create their own relationships with them. And that's that's a really important part of restitution, which is like going in with humility and knowing that people are gonna use things in ways that they need to. And it's not on us to um, like dictate people's relationship with their art and their objects. What do you think the impact has been of the decisions um, that you've made, Niri, at the Smithsonian, um, in, both within your own institution, but I'm also wondering around, you know, uh, um, about other institutions and your colleagues in other institutions around the world who may or may not be considered considered considering restitution. Um, what kind of feedback have you gotten now since, I mean, it's it's been a long process. Um, uh, the work, complicated work that this entailed um, is, uh, underlying you know um this the culminating moment is obviously the return but this has been a, a com complex process involving many people and what kind of feedback um i mean you know that the, the, there was this wonderful ceremony in um in dc in washington dc and in nigeria as well how did you feel in that moment and you know what has the responses been like since then Um, I guess it depends on by whom, you know, when I initially took them down from view, I was really surprised at the response. Like we didn't, I didn't tell anyone, we just took them down. Um, and then, uh, it was kind of funny because Tijani actually, Professor Tijani from Nigeria was at a, a, a ceremony in Aberdeen. And uh, it was a private ceremony, and he mentioned, "Oh, and the Smithsonian is interested in restituting things," because I, I, which was true. But you know, we hadn't announced it. I didn't really feel like performing around it until it was done. Um, and then the, the initial first burst of media had a field day, and I and I kind of wasn't really expecting it. Um, so I, I do realize now that there's a significance around it to the field. I, I think the important point that I always try and make is that. Um, power is complicated um but we all do have a certain element of it and it actually wasn't as complicated as you think it, it was a process but it wasn't a particularly complicated process um it, everyone has known that uh, the bronzes have been stolen I, I don't think there's much historical dispute over who, you know where uh, who took them um, and why they were taken. Um, um, there seems to be a remarkable consensus around that. And for me, that pretty much is the end of the, uh, the conversation. Um, and so, um, I mean, anyone could have done it 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I mean, African countries have been mobilizing museums for restitution, um, you know, since independence movements and before, obviously. Um, and so I guess I'm proud of the fact that I made a decision that I thought was right and I was unprepared myself for the enormity of that decision, but I'm glad that it perhaps has catapulted people to thinking differently about what can and cannot be done. I think people default to it's going to be a complicated thing. Oh, we can't do that. Um, and it's kind of like, well, why not? I, I think that the arguments against restitution are fairly weak, although some merit consideration. And of course, at the Smithsonian, we have things in the public trust. I mean, our collections, we have millions of collections. Uh, we, we keep it in the public trust. We can't be in a position where we just kind of 
uh, you know, we don't want this here anymore. Um, you know, we, there is a certain element of due diligence that has to happen, but it's not difficult nor morally compromising. It just is a process and then, and then you get on with it. For me, the more interesting thing is now, you know, we've signed an MOU with the Benin Museum and we're working at developing a, a co-developed, co-curated project together and looking at what a reparative restitution could really mean and how do we work on an equitable basis. And that's where things get a lot funner as far as I'm concerned, um, because you know we, we probably should never have had the objects to begin with. One of the interesting things in the film um, that is pointed out is around the balance between enormous collections, you know, uh, in the Smithsonian, it's 22,000 or so. Uh, of of artworks from Africa versus um and 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 I mean we're speaking specifically about the Benin and the Benin numbers in the museum which are smaller in relation to you know the 22,000 but one of the um uh points that um the film makes around um just the you know the extent of Africa's cultural patrimony that is outside of Africa in relation to what is being returned um how do you you know what what has the feedback been from you've specifically been obviously working closely with Nigerian um, authorities on on Benin specifically but there is this fear right that if if there's this fear that exists that if if museums start giving one or two or three or four or 30 artworks that um you know uh, what's to stop anyone from asking for, you know, additional artworks? How do you respond to that? Um, that I mean, it's 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 fear mongering. I mean, we have twelve thousand um, objects in our collection. I can guarantee you that uh, the majority of them are um, have pretty solid provenance. Um, and those that don't, uh, those that have been stolen or taken or unethically taken away, should go back. And if if I if <laughs> You know, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, it may not be a popular opinion, but I'm not particularly interested in stewarding a warehouse of stolen loot. Um, and if it's all stolen, then it should go back and the museum should close. I don't think we have an existential right to exist. We're not, we don't have some kind of, you know, divine entitlement um, to do this, but I, I don't think that's what we have either. Um, I, I do think that there is a common perception. I, I was seeing a lot of the comments. It's like, oh my God, you return these 29 and then you know, you're gonna have nothing left in about five seconds. It's absolutely ludicrous. Um, that, you know, I think we have quite strict uh, acquisition policies. And it's true that, you know, why should there be an African art museum with such a collection of 12,000 objects outside of the continent? I, I think that is a very real question that we need to contend with. And how do we ensure that we're relevant for African peoples all over the world, including in the United States? That, that's a slightly separate question, right? Um, and so I think we have to contend with that. At the same time, I mean, recognizing that um, we, yeah, we don't, we don't need to have stolen or unethically acquired work in order to exist. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Mayowa, what has some of the responses been to the platform that you've created and um, the images, uh, digital content that is available open source? Have you been able to track uh, how many people are downloading um, this content? Uh, have you been able to track how people are using it? You know, do you have a sense of the ripples that it is creating out there in the world? I do. Um, I, I, I'm also really curious about the, the question you asked uh, Nairi, which is sort of like, essentially, how do people feel about this idea of if you return one stolen object, you have to re return all of them. And this sort of fear that will museums survive? Um, I just wanted to say it again, because Naira, I think you made such a great point about like, museums don't deserve to survive um, just because they're museums. Um, and I feel like that bears repeating. Museums don't deserve to survive. Um, Necessarily. Necessarily, yes. <laughs> Just a little yes. plug for that because I completely agree with you. We don't have, yeah, yeah. we don't deserve, you know, there's no 
we, right. we need to earn the right, I think. Exactly. Exist. Earn the right. Um, and I think part of what, um, one of the things that I, I think about, especially with returning things in collections, because sometimes it's really valuable things like a Benin bronze or like literally someone's like ancestor or scholar bones or something, things that are like really abhorrent and really need to go back. But I remember I was in a gallery um, in Germany and I saw a film where the a museum, a curator in Namibia was like, we have this ragged doll that is handmade. We have no idea why we got this. We don't know who it was taken from. And I think she was having a really interesting reaction to like, did we steal an object from a child? You know, so like the objects in museums and the stuff that's like in your in the museum basements isn't all just like super valuable things. Sometimes they don't even know why they have them. So it's like it's kind of strange how museums often fight to keep those collections. You know, like why? So um, I I really love that question. That's why I wanted to jump on it. But in terms of like the um, impact of the work that we do in terms of who's using it and what that looks like, um, I think one of the, the, the things in, in terms of like what impact looks like, um, this was, I was in Nigeria a few years ago and I was showing, I was at just an event and there was a young woman that was looking at a Benin bronze in Nigeria for the first time in augmented reality on her phone. Like let that sink in. She lives in Nigeria. She was born there, has never left. Because she couldn't travel to New York or England or Berlin or whatever, she wasn't able to see these objects. So when we talk about the, the impact, a lot of it is just like interpersonal like that, the idea of like a personal museum, personal experience. And then we also have over a thousand downloads um, of these objects on our Sketchfab page. Um, I think the other impact that we're talking about is like I'm collaborating with a, an artist in Germany who's making a video game about decolonized art collections. So some of our 3D models like that mask are going to be part of her collection. Um, we commissioned uh, an artist in South Africa, a street artist, who's made like essentially his own street art collection based on this. We've um, we've used these images, uh, a, a machine learning scientist used the images that we had gathered and trained an AI model on this to generate these fake Benin bronzes. So for us, it's like the impact is, is like, what are we inspiring from a creative and storytelling perspective um, as much as it is who's downloading and interacting with it? Because we, we want people to do things with it that we never thought about. So that's part of our impact as well, like artistically. So you just mentioned the word um, de decolonial project, and uh, we talked a little bit earlier about that as well in different contexts. What, what does that mean in an institutional context for you, Nidhi? And what does that mean for you, Mayowa, as an, as an artist and creative and, and, and a kind of creative act activist? Um, for me, it, it, um, it means decentering uh, European and Eurocentric uh, view and practice around African art. Um, and that practice and that um, philosophical underpinnings, I suppose, our knowledge under epistemological underpinnings manifests in different forms of practice on conservation protocols, how you conserve, what is an object? Is it alive? Does it have spirit? What is the best way to keep it? Um, it manifests in the language we use to name it. What do we call this? Is it an art? Is it, is it a, you know, what is it um, in the language? Uh, and, and also in what language? Uh, is it in English? Is it in Igbo? Is it in Swahili? Is it in Arabic? Um, it manifests in how we interpret and it manifests how we display and design, et cetera. And I think it's, it's interesting to see museums as a product of the enlightenment, as a product of a particular time in the world in where a particular form of European reason um, 
was considered to be universal reason um, and absolute truth. Um, and at the same time that the colonial project in terms of you know, the subjugation of peoples all over the world was an absolute full force um, and the invention of race, et cetera. Um, and so museums, you know, museum practice is largely in, informed through a European view of the world. Um, our, our mission is to be a 21st century global African art museum. And, and we spend a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to be an African art museum in the 21st century, not in the 19th century, um, not in the 18th century, and not actually in the 20th century. But what does it mean in the 21st century with, um, you know, when people have are digital natives, they have access to the technology that Maya is using. Um, there's different experiences of mobility, there's different experiences of identity. Um, people have different, you know, I was saying this morning, you know, when my parents immigrated to Canada, you know, you immigrate and then you just don't go home for 15 years, 20 years, right? But now you come, you could spend a few years here, you go back, you're on FaceTime, you're on Skype, you're, you know, whatever. Like there's there's a fluidity to the way that I think many global Africans um, in, engage with the world that, that you wouldn't have had, um, you know, 20 years ago. So what does it mean to operate as a museum within that context? And, and, and I think Maya's project is so interesting in that way, because it shows that you don't have to, you know, you don't have to come in and see an object in order to have a relationship with it. And it's, so it's liberating, once again, it's sort of going back to the, the liberating the art <laughs> from its institutional trappings. Um, I think Maya's project is very interesting because it's not putting it back in its original source either. I mean, you're 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 not locating the work in the royal palace, and so it would be curious to see what you know the Obas feel about the work that you're doing. But you're enabling a, a completely different conversation. It's not a a restore going back to the past. It's a it's a looking towards the future. Mayowa. Yeah, I. What does the decolonial project mean to you? To me, um, I think the things that mark uh, a decolonial project to me are we, yeah, we're, there's a lot of similarities to what Nam Nairi said in terms of the idea of a decentralized relationship to your collection or to these objects where other people like. No one person gets to decide um, what the what the future of these objects. It means that, for example, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, it does the work that I've done can live on because it it's in open source collections. It can be remixed, and this work can continue without me at the helm. Um, I think it also means that like the a lot of the work that we do actively challenges the idea of ownership at all. And maybe that's also because, like you said, I'm a digital native. I don't own a lot of things. I don't own my music. Um, so for me to decolonize these, what decolonization means in the context of these objects is that no one institution, no one power gets to own or or have them. I mean, it's it means that the people it's not just a bunch of heads of states shaking hands with museums. It's everyone is included in that conversation, you know, and what and and the story that gets told about these objects. Um, I think a lot of the work that Nairi is doing is already like doing um, like speaking to that. And I think that one of the things that's been really incredible to see, like because of you know, books like the Brutish Museums where um, curators and even like Benedict Savoy uh, and I forget, Emmanuel, um, what's the co-author's name? Aline Sa. Thank you. Um, like a lot of the, the work that they're doing, they're approaching a lot of their work in an anti-racist, um, anti-capitalist way. And I love that some of those conversations and questions are also coming from within the institution because a decolonialized approach doesn't necessarily mean it can't happen. It means everyone's in invited to do this work together, not just um, everyone can be part of liberation and we all benefit from the liberation 
that comes with a decolonized approach to uh, museums and institutions. But, but, you know, it's interesting that you say that, right? Because, you know, they're not the same thing. And so, as I, I mentioned earlier- so, so, our, Sorry, tell me more. They're not, what's not the same thing? A democratic approach where everyone decides is mm. not necessarily a, a decolonial approach. Mm. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, the Smithsonian has an open access policy. So our bronzes uh, right. were open access. I mean, most of our collections at the Smithsonian are open access. When we decided to transfer ownership of the bronzes back to the Nigerian government, we stopped them being open access because it wasn't up for us to make that decision anymore. Um, and I think that it's it's a very interesting, um, it hasn't happened in this case, but I think that in the restitution debate, if you do a total restoration, it means that you don't get to decide what happens to them. And so in fact, it is completely within the rights of the Nigerian government to put it away and not give it access to anybody ever, or to put it back to the palace. I don't think that's what they're planning to do with it. Frankly, I didn't actually ask. Um, it wasn't my business. And that is a really, it's a really, you know, what would I prefer? What would I do? You know, what are my beliefs? They're very much aligned with yours, but in a way, who cares what I think? You know what I mean? They're not mine to decide. And I think that it's very interesting because the, the argument against restitution has often been that, well, they're gonna hide it from view and these things deserve to be seen by the whole world and the public. And in fact, it's a very, it's a, that, that's the irony, right? Which is like, we, we have a, 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 we are making it universal. We are opening it up for everybody. And that is the purview of the West. And what happens if they go to Nigeria? No one's ever going to be able to see them again, because apparently no people live in Nigeria or no, no people, you know what I mean? And so I, I think it's a, a quite an interesting debate. And for us, it's been fascinating around how do we deal with the digital, the metadata, the documentation, the registration? Um, you know, what is what is our responsibility in terms of ensuring that that stuff um, remains accessible? Or is it just not our business? We just have to shut it down and give it to someone else to decide. I want to also come back to um, something you said earlier, Neri, which was around the museum of the 21st century, you know, and in the form it also linked museums and the birth of museums in Europe in the 19th century, late 19th century, uh, early 19th century, to the colonial project and colonial expansion that actually one of the interesting interviews um, it is by Benedict Savoy, where she talks about how um, uh, cultural um, uh, colonial policy uh, included um, competition over royal artifacts. You know, um, this is is uh, one of those little niche areas of colonialism, right? Is 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 the cultural policies and how this was really linked to Europeans museums flourishing, um, so direct links between the Trocadero or Tafurin, et cetera, and the different colonies in, in Africa, Belgian, French, uh, British, et cetera. Um, and it's, it struck me that today, of course, we are in this situation where people uh, are expressing their opinions on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, you know, there is this, it, it's a whole, uh, different um, environment, right? Because uh, you wearing this t-shirt, Mayor was saying museums are not neutral, right? Um, and so that as a movement too, and the Instagram page for that, and the comments that people are able to submit anonymously, people working inside of museums, outside of museums. So I find it that we are at a really exciting time. Um, and you know, where there is, there are so many voices um, that can be heard, that are heard, that are expressed. Um, and that that is really exciting when you think that previously the museum was so impervious, you know, so impenetrable to criticism, to change, to being shaped from the outside, right? From the public, from public culture. And I think that is ex that is exciting because we are now in a situation where we can be museums, you know, for these times. Um, and and so I, you know, I, I think it's it's 
it's far more exciting than um, uh, people might imagine it is. A lot of the debates and conversations and information around restitution is so rooted in the past and in repairing uh, in some way, you know, the past and restoring in some way the past. Um, and yet African culture and creativity has evolved has changed over time, has thrived in, in certain um, ways as well. And um, something that really resonates with me um, is uh, actually by um, uh, uh, the Vietnamese American writer Ocean Vong, um, this incredibly beautiful first novel that he wrote um, that was called uh, on Earth, We Briefly Gorgeous, which is a story about surviving the aftermath of trauma as a Vietnamese uh, American. And there's uh, a, a quote from the book that I, you know, I keep um, stuck on my pin board where he says, uh, and I quote, he says, all this time I told myself we were born from war, but I was wrong, Ma. We were born from beauty. Let no one mistake us for the fruit of violence, but that violence having passed through the fruit failed to spoil it." Close quote. And to me, that speaks to so much to uh, African past and, and experiences of co colonization, decolonization as well, um, and African presence too, the African present too, but that these fractured narratives, fractured histories, families, cultures, etc., that salvation can come um, from these uh, gestures and um, from these uh, different interventions and activities that, uh, and, and from art itself, right, from music, from writing, from um, uh, from uh, the historical artworks, from contemporary artists, that uh that I feel sometimes this the the rooting within the past obviously because it is about uh, addressing these very specific instances of violent looting etc um but sometimes that can also occlude the evolutions and changes that have taken place in the royal kingdom of Benin in the you know evolution of um the Edo uh, state and and Nigerian political and social and cultural organization too, and so I'm very excited to see you know more of um, and and maybe as a curator working closely with artists I see that more within the curatorial and the artistic that you know that excitement about uh, um, um, and um, deep engagement with Africa's past. Um, as well as with critical theory, as well as with contemporary artistic practices, as well as with activism, you know, um, and that is so. So, for me, these historical collections um, that we steward and have in our care as Africans who live in America um, also point the ways to this future, you know. Um, they, for me, they point the way to this future that we want to create, um, that is more egalitarian, more equal, more um, respectful, more caring, more where we can see ourselves as, you know, um, respected and fully, uh, our personhood fully uh, present. And so, for, so, you know, in terms of thinking through the future and thinking through this moment, I'm curious about what does excite you too about moving, you know, moving, moving forward. And then there's um, a number of really great questions from the audience um, that I would like to uh, throw in there after we've had a moment to respond. And sorry for, you know, that uh, uh, rather long, uh, soliloquy there, but I'm very passionate about these issues. No, I mean, what excites me is work that, uh, like that Maya was doing. And what ex excites me is working with artists and designers and rethinking things. Um, and what excites me is also deeper knowing and, and going to 
people who have different kinds of knowledge um, and bringing those people together. I find that incredibly rewarding. And it's not just academics or people with a PhD, but practitioners, traditional leaders, spiritual practitioners, um, musicians, artists, you know, all of these ways of knowing coming together in, you know, into such a swirl is incredibly exciting. And I love working at an art museum. I love working with living artists and working with non-living artists, frankly, um, and working with the artwork. It is, it is a complete and perpetual process of becoming, of always progressing, of always, or not progressing. I don't know. I mean, it's always moving. And I think for me, that's the absolutely most important thing about this is that we're not the authorities, we're not immovable, we're not like, you know, we're not a monument. Um, we are always a fluid moment in time and a dance between visitors and artwork and artists and the institution, the architects, the temperature control, um, and the weather, quite frankly. We are, we are, it, it is a dynamic of all of these things, and everybody gets what they can out of this. Um, and 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 I and I love that. I, it, I'm tremendously excited about the work that I do and the people that I work with. And the relationship I feel to Africa arts, Africa's art and culture is also temporal. You know, it's also where you enter on the spectrum, right? And it, it, it's it's a temporality more than a linear progression of past, present, future, but rather where one intersects with 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 all of that. Mayowa, um, did you want to add something to yeah. to just yeah, I think the spirit of, you know, of all this violence. For sure. I mean, I think that to talk about the museum of the 21st century or the future, it's always useful to go back to the past, you know, to remember that museums and object collections are very tied up in in colonial in colonialism and in genocide and in sort of like using that museum as a, as like a, a type of technology to perpetuate this worldview of these people are primitive and um and and yeah I, I think that that's kind of unfortunately that's just the legacy that museums are inheriting and curators today are inheriting a long past that starts in that. And for me, as I think of the museum of the 21st century, I it is participatory at its core. Um, what is exciting in it is it's nuanced, it's open to criticism, it's a little chaotic and exciting because a lot of folks um, are involved in this conversation who weren't before. You know, in the past, the 3D Sorry, in the past, you know, most of 3D scanning would have been done by an internal team at this at a big museum with a big, big fund. Whereas like some jerk in Oakland with an iPhone is walking around museums and documenting and scanning things that are on display and giving them away to other people. So for me, it's um it's largely just participatory, it is risky. And it is, uh, it's ripe with potential because people will take this, the more people are part of the conversation. Yes, there's a risk, of course, like um, Nairi was getting at where, for example, you know, these, let's say sacred objects or religious objects are now in the hands of people who are not initiated. And that's always a risk. And that is, that's, I obviously don't have the, the, the tools to like figure out the best way to do that. But I think the other side of it is that there's a lot more people involved in the conversation who can now decide and who can now become part of shaping. If the if museums continue to exist, it is because people are invited to participate in shaping the future of museums. Um, and that's what's exciting for me. Absolutely. And there's a wonderful book that I'll plug by Nico Whedon called Museum Metamorphosis that assembles all these people to contribute to this conversation around changing museums. And, and I want also, you know, to I, I always also remember that um, 
museums, uh, even though they appear to be these monolithic um, structures that are unchanging, they have in fact changed. They might change like lava, slow moving lava, but you know, they are pe pe people make up uh, institutions and people shape institutions. And even if in a very small way, like introducing a cultural protocol to the work that we do from conservation to curatorial to installation to, and technical when working with sacred objects, for me, that even that is a win, you know. Um, but I'm going to go to the Q and A because we have a few questions here. Um, Julian Bingham asks, as a small local museum in South Carolina that has a collection of around 2,500 African ethnographic artifacts, how do we start the restitution repatriation process? The items are no longer mission related and it's in our institutional plan to transfer or repatriate to a more fitting institution. How should we start? I believe my board's approval is likely. <laughs> I don't know if there's a formula. Um, <laughs> I think that um, I, I think it's by asking the source communities or the communities of origin or the artists who created the work or the context of the work and 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 having starting with the dialogue of that. I, I think a lot of this does start with research, but it's quite interesting because you have to consider who's doing the research. So you know in a way, you know, you talked about it earlier by your, your, your Yoruba talking about Edo um, cultural um, patrimony, you know, what, you know, who's interpreting and who's making the knowledge or whatever makes a big difference. So um, it's hard to say in this instance, but I think that sort of an intent to look more deeply into the practices is a good way to start. And having institutional support is also a good way to start. You know, I think that, Nari, you were really fortunate to be in an institution, like you said, that had this um, long history and relationship of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, repatriation of Native American, you know, uh, cultural objects. And so they, you were in a context where there was a lot of institutional support for you know moving um that forward so i think that um those are, are kind of go hand in hand that dialogue with knowing that your institution has your back and you know um but as you point out you know institutions are people and i make this point often um and i'm not sure actually if they appreciate me making the point but um Lonnie Bunch is the first African-American secretary of the Smithsonian, all the Smithsonian museums. Um, that's not a small thing. He's the founding director of the American, African-American history and culture. When you, his undersecretary, Kevin Gover, who's my boss, is a Native American and the former director of the Native Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, both of them are the first time that they've been museum um, specialists and experts in those positions, but also um, colonized, or I don't know what you call it, people who have a long personal and deep history with the impact of museum practice and the negative impact of museum practice. I don't think that you know the fact that the Smithsonian is making a shift in its policies um, is separate somehow from those two people in leadership positions. And, and, I, and I, I say that it's important because when we talk about decolonization, we have to talk about who we're hiring, hiring practices, and who are making decisions. And it's not just a, a box ticking exercise, right? It's not just about, okay, well, we have our, our requirements around diversity and we need to reach them. It's that, that when you have a deep and personal um, drive or connection to something, it influences your professional practice. Not always, every time, but it makes a big difference. Um, and so institutional support is important, but it's, it, you know, how do you get that institutional support? It's like, who's on your board? Who are you hiring? Who are given opportunities? Who are making the decisions within those institutions is something that I think is critically important to this conversation. 
We have a question here for Mayowa. I'm curious about how the digital intersects with the physical, asked Elaine Sullivan. For example, you mentioned that you have presented the project in Nigeria and people reacted by saying this was the first experience they had with the bronzes. That said, some Benin bronzes have been on view in Nigeria for decades. Are people inspired to go visit the National Museum in Lagos and see great works of Nigerian art in person after learning about the works thanks to your project? Yeah, um, I think there's a couple of things in this uh, question. I think one thing you, are people inspired to visit the National Museum after they learn about the work? I think that <laughs> what what's funny is the people that I've told about this work and have been really excited about it have been, um, often when they travel in Europe, like for example, my, my sister was just in, um, where was she? In Aust she was in Austria. And while she was there, she was like, oh, I'm going to go to the museum. And I was like, oh, they have bronzes there randomly. So like, yes, the, the truth is people are inspired to go see them in person. Um, I would say that when, when I have been to the National Museum, maybe because I'm visiting in the middle of the week or it's in the holiday season, um, there isn't a ton of foot traffic. And that's probably because, you know, Programming is hard. Marketing is hard. So like getting people into the museum is not an AR model helps, but it takes ideally more than just everyone coming together to make better stories and nuanced stories. And, and I think the other thing that you're actually working against that's bigger than the museums is like, there's a reason why I didn't learn about the Benin bronzes um, because, and because the truth is like the, colonial education I inherited meant that I was learning about British history. I was learning, I was taking my GCSEs, um, which is British education. And sort of the legacy of this British colonial system is that there isn't as much education and knowledge that people get from schools. Like my siblings who spent more longer in Nigeria didn't know about these objects. So I think that it's it's bigger than just me as an individual showing AR in order to get people excited and interested. Like the film was important. The repatriation is important. The like getting it back to the Benin royal family, um, all of those things are equally important when it comes to creating a relationship to the physical objects, in my opinion. And Nairi, you look like you're about to jump in, maybe. <gasps> okay. <laughs> I hear you. I agree. Mm -hmm. We have uh, maybe our last question from Lauren Hansen. Um, do you agree that museums saw the landscape change around them instead of changing it themselves? You know, I although I often do critique museums, I I I don't think it's entirely fair. Because I would say that as long as I've been working, I have had colleagues around me who have been working for change in and outside of museums. I think that it does a huge disservice to those colleagues who have been saying the same things for 30, 40, 50 years um, to, to just pretend that they don't exist. Museums are not monolithic places and there has always been people who have worked very hard to try and change things within the museum. I think that the museum, perhaps on a director level or a decision-making level, um, have been slow to react. Um, and I think that pressure from the outside has certainly influenced change um, on that level, which has led to transformational change. But there has definitely been people, and there continues to be people within museums that are motivating for different ways of doing things. Thank you. Um... With that, I would like to thank Nidhi and Mayowa for being here and to our audience out there and over to you, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, 
Thank you all. This has been a really engaging and thought-provoking and stimulating conversation. I want to thank again our partners, KERA, Birmingham Civil Rights Museum, Maine Public Television, and World Channel. We really would ask everyone who's participated and listened to this wonderful conversation to take a moment to fill out our survey. We would love to learn more about how we can serve you better with future events like this one. And finally, I want to thank my colleagues, Ebony Johnson and Elizabeth Gessel, who made this event possible. They both worked hard hanging in to make sure we had a way to make this event happen. And I really appreciate that. So uh, to Natasha, Nairi, and Mailwa, thank you so much. We've learned so much from all of you. Continue your good work. And from Black Public Media, I say good evening. Thank you all. Ciao.